Of all their evil actions, nothing defines the Nazis like the final solution. The murder of some six million Jews. But how did they get an entire nation to buy into the wholesale slaughter of an innocent race? They're performing murder and terrible crimes, but at the same time trying to make it look as though it's correct. This is the story of how Hitler and the Nazis groomed the German people. He likened the Jews to a virus or a, a, a wound that, that won't heal. Using all their darkest arts to make them complicit. We do have partners in crime here. In the worst genocide in human history. Of one thing, Hitler never makes any secret. He hates the Jews. Recovering from his wounds at the end of the First World War, he blames left-wing Jewish politicians for surrendering, stabbing Germany in the back. In the 1920s depression, he rails against a Jewish conspiracy, the root of all evil from communism to corrupt financiers this poisoning of the nation. The German Jew is the enemy within. He's an enemy in, in racial terms, in cultural terms, in national terms. The Jew's greatest crime is that they pollute the pure genes of the Aryan master race. They must be eliminated. The nation is no longer willing to be sucked dry by these parasites. Everything he'd said since 1922 pointed towards the ultimate idea that you rid yourself of the Jews physically. By 1941, he is master of everything. He has defeated France, captured Poland, and his army is advancing deep into the Soviet Union. Now he can begin on a lifetime's ambition to create a pure German nation, free of Jews. But how can he carry the German people with him? He has always been aware his anti-Jewish policy is an acutely sensitive issue for ordinary citizens. In fact, during his first four years in power, Hitler barely mentions the Jews in public. And when he does move against them, it is slowly, step by step. They're banned from certain professions. Then they lose their rights as citizens and their livelihoods. Thousands are driven to flee abroad. During all of this, there are some objections. However, most Germans just stand and watch. But the actual killing, the elimination of all those who remain, their own neighbors, is still a step too far. He recognized in the German people there was this residual sense of decency, which could be offended by horrific policies. But killing Jews is indecent. It will take all the Nazis' skill to sell this to the German people. It's a task for Joseph Goebbels, the Nazis' master of persuasion. Goebbels shares the Führer's loathing of the Jews and is determined to convince his fellow Germans. It was Goebbels who was responsible for selling the idea that the Jews were this kind of cancer or this plague at the heart of German society. He realised that if you could control what people consumed, then you could control them and he was one of the first people to realize that. Cinema is one of his favorite tools for manipulating public opinion. The film, The Eternal Jew, produced by Goebbels' propaganda unit, has a stark message. Wherever Jews settle, 
They behave like rats and parasites. The film portrays the Jew as the eternal corrupter, specifically, of course, in the sense of, of Germanhood. The greatness of the German state will be destroyed if the enemy within, the eternal Jew, is allowed to go on performing his acts of destruction. But when the film is released, it's a box office flop. It's a lesson for the Nazis. Persuading the German people to buy into this evil agenda is going to be a complex process. The danger lies in inflaming public opinion, and the risk of getting things wrong is already brutally clear. Since 1939, the Nazis have been carrying out a secret euthanasia campaign. It will become their dry run for how to commit mass murder without upsetting the German public. First, they need willing accomplices. Pliable nurses and doctors are instructed to single out terminally ill and disabled children. The next step is to deceive the people who might object. Parents are told their loved ones are to be sent to care centers for special treatment. And finally, they need a method of killing, quiet and discreet. They choose murder by lethal injection. Some 5,000 innocent children are killed their only crime to be sick or disabled. The truth is hidden by false death certificates, blaming measles or pneumonia. It's Hitler sort of kind of dipping his toe in the water with the German public to see what he can get away with. Then the regime escalates the program, targeting tens of thousands of disabled adults in institutions across Germany. Ramping up the numbers involves more doctors, and some voice doubts about the legality of the policy. It's a problem that goes to the Führer himself. And so Hitler wrote a note, which he rarely did, and signed, saying to the people in the Chancellery concerned with the medical profession that this was now a policy that could be followed legitimately. For the German doctors, it's now official. They are obeying the Führer's orders. That's what the new culture is, they say to themselves. That's the environment. Uh, that's the classic road to hell. A secret department, known as T4, is set up to mastermind the process. To kill so many, quickly and quietly, they need new techniques. What the men at T4 come up with is a shower room. Except these pipes and shower heads don't carry water. They deliver poisonous carbon monoxide gas. In many ways, the euthanasia program uh, represents the absolute bestiality of the Nazi regime. Tens of thousands of Germany's sick and disabled are murdered in this way. And it's an extraordinary program because all those involved knew what was going on. It's not as if they were blinded. They accept that euthanasia is a legitimate policy. The killing of Germans by Germans is legitimate. But then the truth about the killing starts to leak out. Gradually, of course, the public living close to those institutions began to get an awareness that something unusual was going on. People start to worry. Other sick relatives might be the next victims. The discussion starts here and there about, will this be applied to our wounded soldiers? The Catholic Church picks up on the public fears and stands up to the regime. 
famously Bishop van Galen gave a sermon in which he denounced this program, um, not on the grounds that it is necessarily unethical to kill people, but on the grounds that these were Germans that were being killed. He emphasized that these were our brethren, members of our families. The outcry becomes so strong, Hitler is forced to make a rare public climb down, officially halting his euthanasia campaign within Germany. The protest against euthanasia has taught the Nazis several lessons. First, if their racial policies threaten German families, public opinion won't wear it. Second, any further killing will have to be well hidden, far from Germany itself. And third, the Führer must not be associated with anything disreputable. These lessons will define how the Nazis deal with the Jews. In particular, Hitler will never personally sign a compromising document. He didn't want his own name associated with the worst extremities of the anti-Jewish program. Two years into the war, Hitler is riding high on the success of his campaign against the Soviet Union. He is content to leave the handling of the Jewish question to his loyal henchmen. Officially, Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, Hitler's number two, is in charge of Jewish affairs. But in fact, it will be Hitler's fanatical SS, selected for their devotion to the Nazi cause, who will deliver the final solution. Their leader is Heinrich Himmler, a Nazi party member since the 1920s, he shares Hitler's resolve to rid Germany of the Jews. And his right-hand man, SS General Reinhard Heydrich, is even more terrifying. He found in his subordinate, Reinhard Heydrich, absolutely the perfect man to carry out the destruction of a people. As head of the Nazi security forces, Reinhard Heydrich is one of the most feared men in Germany. If you gave Hitler a piece of paper, and asked them to sketch out the perfect Nazi, I think he probably would have sketched out Reinhard Heydrich. He was tall, he was blonde, he was athletic. He is a man of many talents. A champion fencer, a fighter pilot, a skilled violinist. But above all, he is a fanatical Nazi. He had all the characteristics that made him the Aryan Superman. Heydrich really is the rising man of the Nazi racial killing machine. Since 1939, Heydrich has been wreaking havoc in the conquered territories in the East. His secret death squads, the Einsatzgruppen, slaughter thousands of Polish Jews. Those who survive are rounded up into ghettos. Nearly three million await their fate in appalling conditions. Then Heydrich's SS thugs follow Germany's armies into the Soviet Union, continuing their murderous campaign against the Jews. News of Heydrich's massacres in the East begins to trickle back home to Germany. Dear Hannah, last night 150 Jews were shot in this town. Men, women and children all bumped off. Don't worry about it. It has to be done. But don't tell anyone else. Many thousands of Germans now know what is happening out east. But they do nothing. It confirms what the Nazis learnt from the euthanasia program. They can get away with killing Jews out of sight, far from home. 
So this was something that was percolating outwards inside Nazi Germany. It was sort of, um, you know, the secret that would never dare to speak its name. As Heydrich plots a far bigger attack on the Jews, he needs authority from above. He can't get it from Hitler, who wants to keep his involvement secret. So Heydrich turns to someone else and prepares one of the most important documents in the story of the final solution. He takes his secret letter to the home of Reich Marshal Hermann Goering. The man Hitler has officially put in charge of Nazi Jewish policy. What Heydrich wants is Goering's signature, authorizing him to produce a plan for the Nazis' intended final solution to the Jewish question. This is the stamp of approval he needs. But it will be another five months before Heydrich has his plan in place. Meanwhile, Hitler's armies are pushing deeper and deeper into the Soviet Union. Far from the eyes of the German people, Heydrich's killer squads are ramping up their slaughter of the Jews. They're looking for the most efficient method for mass murder, still just using bullets. Soon, Heydrich's SS develop a sinister routine. The Jews are rounded up and taken to a remote execution site. The first arrivals are forced to dig a pit. What happens next is revealed in this amateur film shot in Latvia by a German soldier. A group of Jews is lined up in front of the mass grave and shot. Then another group is brought in, layer upon layer. The Nazis call it sardine packing. Here we see a massive escalation of the policy of extermination of the Jews going on. In effect, we have now a holocaust of Soviet Jews already taking place. The worst slaughter takes place in the Ukraine at the ravine known as Babi Yar. 33,000 are killed in just two days. As Heydrich ramps up the slaughter, he finds he doesn't have enough of his racist SS thugs. He needs new recruits. There is some evidence that there was a bit more resistance to, to taking part in the killings than, than perhaps there would have been in the Einsatzgruppen, but this was by and large overcome, and it was done by, by the use of, for example, alcohol uh, given out freely uh, to these people that would anaesthetize them against the, against the effects, if you like, of seeing large numbers of people killed in front of them. But Heydrich knows this mass killing is still taking its toll on his men. Most of these men rapidly became horribly troubled and disturbed. And it's very largely this experience which pushes Himmler and Heydrich to look for other ways of killing huge numbers of people. Back home, Hitler is still looking for a way to deal with the 200,000 Jews living in Germany. Everybody knew Jews. They were part of German society. They were Germans. They had fought in the First World War. They had won Iron Crosses. So Goebbels' propaganda machine has to be mobilized to create a sense of difference, to set them apart from their pure-blood German neighbors. Stage one, give them a star. A Jewish German and a non-Jewish German may not look that different. But what you can do is label them with a star. 
and it's the yellow star is absolutely key to differentiating them and it starts kind of staining them. Anyone above the age of six is obliged to wear the yellow Star of David. This is the real moment at which they really say to the people on the streets, these people are different from everybody else. They're not German, they are Jewish, and the Jews are an unwanted race in our Third Reich. Stage two is to make sure Germans do not socialize with Jews, to keep them physically apart. Don't be fooled into thinking, ah, he's nice because I know him. He's a Jew, they're Jews, and therefore they're a threat. Goebbels keeps up a stream of propaganda, carrying the insidious message that it's not the Nazis who are turning on the Jews. The Jews have brought this misery on themselves. For one of his slogans of the week, he uses a quote from Hitler. If the international Jewish financiers should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, then the result will not be the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. It is a masterful piece of propaganda. It absolves the German people of any guilt the Jews will be responsible for their own destruction. The single most disturbing thing that Goebbels achieved, that was scapegoating. He was polluting the mind of a nation. Slowly but surely, the Nazis are grooming German citizens to accept the removal of the 200,000 Jews still living as their neighbors. However, even now, they are wary of inflaming domestic public opinion. The hard line is softened for public consumption so that people who are already been trained to be anti-Jewish are not pushed too far. The man in charge, SS General Reinhard Heydrich, begins a campaign of deception. The official line is that the Jews are to be resettled in the East. Heydrich, of course, realises that what you can't just say uh, publicly is, right, we're going to kill six million people tomorrow morning. Um, you know, you, you've got to do a bit more subtly than that. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about evacuating people to the east, um, you've got to make it look as though they really are just being evacuated to the east. So Heydrich sets up a model camp at Theresienstadt in the occupied Czech territory. Newsreels are released showing it as a safe place where German Jews can resettle. And it was provided with facilities that many ordinary Germans didn't have. Um, swimming pools, complex of cinemas, massage areas. The idea being that although we've removed the Jew from our midst, we're not making him suffer because we're giving him a way of life which is perfectly consistent with civilized standards. It's a cruel deceit. For most Jews, Theresienstadt is really just a stop before they are sent on their way to the horrific ghettos in occupied Poland and around the Baltic. And that's one of the kind of terrifying elements of the Nazi regime is they're doing, performing murder and terrible crimes, but at the same time trying to make it look as though it's correct. But Heydrich's deportation of the German Jews creates a new problem. Out in the east, the ghettos are already crammed full. Because of the overcrowding, local Nazi leaders in the occupied territories start to kill Jews to make space for the newcomers. This almost leads to a public relations disaster. In late 1941, a thousand German Jews are dispatched east to the model camp at Theresienstadt. And these aren't just any Jews. Many of them are elderly war heroes, holders of the Iron Cross. Then there's an error. They're sent to a ghetto in Latvia, 
where Jews are being massacred. But because of a mix-up in the administration of it, they end up in Riga and most of them are shot. It's a catastrophic error. If the news leaks out, the German people would be appalled. It's a warning to Heydrich and SS chief Heinrich Himmler. Killing German Jews needs their close control. By now, their plans for the SS to deliver the final solution are ready. An elegant lakeside villa in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee is the venue for a top secret meeting. High-ranking civil servants, the men who run the German state, Nazi party officials, and members of the Reich security forces assemble for one of the most notorious gatherings in history. In this quiet, palatial atmosphere, all of the stakeholders who will decide the fate of European Jews are assembled. Awaiting them will be Adolf Eichmann, chief organizer of Jewish deportation. He is to become a key player in the Nazis' final solution. Eichmann was a virulent anti-Semite. He was a uh, very uh, passionate man in many ways. He was a drunkard. He had affairs. He was a very committed Nazi. And he really felt that what he was doing was absolutely right. And he wasn't just doing it because he was a, a boring civil servant. He was doing it because he wanted to kill Jews. His role today is to keep the minutes of the meeting. The mood is relaxed, despite the sinister agenda. Eichmann's superior, Heydrich, is in the chair. First, Heydrich makes it clear his authority comes from the very top, via Goering, Hitler's number two. And what he is putting forward is an SS-run operation. What Heydrich had to do was to establish that what he was doing, or proposing at, at Vance, was in fact the Fuhrer's policy. The meeting is so sensitive, the only reference to the Nazis' real plan is in the careful language of Eichmann's minutes. The Jews already under German control will be put to work in the East. The majority will die. Those that survive will have to be dealt with appropriately. Dealt with appropriately is code for what we know as the final solution. The plan is to kill all of the 11 million Jews in Europe. It is genocide. This is a task too big for Heydrich's death squads. It will require murder on an industrial scale. What Heydrich brought to the table was an incredibly analytical mind, a very, very cold, callous, evil way of thinking that could just regard genocide as a kind of uh, challenge for a civil servant. Heydrich needs the men around him to mobilize Germany's resources and infrastructure. They will have to be involved in this crime. Vance is the coming together in administration terms of all the leading authorities concerned with transport, with um, gathering of the Jews, with treatment of them when they're there, the food supplies, etc. That's, got, that's, a, that's a logistical problem that's got to be resolved by logistical means. To Heydrich's relief, there is no dissent. In just over an hour, Heydrich has the agreement he wants. The German state will be mobilized and the SS are in charge of the final solution. Now it's just a question of practicalities. In the remote area of eastern Poland, there are huge swathes of deep, 
dark forest. If you want to get rid of a people, that's the place to do it. This is a place where people can just disappear. The SS already has a base here, in the city of Lublin. They have rounded up thousands of Jews into labor camps and ghettos. They must now be discreetly killed. Heydrich has already been experimenting on the best way to do it. He's brought in his top expert in mass murder. One of the most unpleasant of a very unpleasant bunch called Nazis was a fellow called Christian Wirth. Uh, he's involved in the euthanasia program. He designs the death rooms uh, and he uses his knowledge and experience to apply it to extermination of Jews. And he was the one that said, you can't destroy Jews at piecemeal as we did in the euthanasia program. We need 1,000 a day, 2,000 a day. See this as a major logistical problem. On his way to Lublin, Wirt does some research. At the town of Helmno, they are already experimenting on how to kill Polish Jews. First, they are led into a sealed chamber, unaware they are entering the back of a large truck. Exhaust fumes are pumped in, and the victims soon die of carbon monoxide poisoning. But killing one truckload of 50 Jews at a time is not going to deliver the final solution. Wirt's orders are for mass murder hidden away in Poland's dense forests. He needs a more efficient, continuous process to kill the numbers required. So, at his first location, near the remote village of Belzets, Wirt installs a static combustion engine to pump exhaust fumes into large, sealed gas chambers. Belzets becomes a blueprint for other secret death camps. Sobibor and Treblinka. With Helmno, they form a lethal network of extermination, all carefully chosen because they are close to the railway lines. The Nazis now carry out the first stage of their plan. They liquidate the ghettos. Some one and a half million Jews are shipped to these camps, crammed into cattle trucks and goods wagons, brought in like cargo, to be eliminated swiftly and out of sight. Unlike the vast concentration camps in Germany, which were prisons, these death factories take up just a small clearing. These forests are places where evil happens, and the Nazis chose a spot that almost feels evil before what they did there took place. It is quite the most terrifying spot, and it's not just terrifying because what we now know that happened there, it's terrifying because it's remote, it's dark, it's lonely, and it's sort of a place that just gives you a sense of absolute hopelessness. Hidden from German eyes, the rounding up of Polish Jews is a brutal affair. A very different challenge is how to round up German Jews and send them to the death camps. The man in charge of this problem is Heydrich's killer bureaucrat, Adolf Eichmann. He is the mastermind of the deportation program. The Holocaust, the destruction of the Jews, was a bureaucratic process. And to run a bureaucratic process, you need bureaucrats. Adolf Eichmann is the archetypal bureaucrat. Functioning, in an administrative sense, is the key to success of any policy. It's got to be programmed. The issue facing Eichmann is how to get rid of these Jews without upsetting their neighbors, without ordinary Germans finding out what is really going on. The answer is the familiar Nazi tactic, deception. People are told that the Jews are being resettled, sent to a safe destination. At the railway stations, they won't see any sinister cattle trucks. The Jews leave on comfortable passenger trains with tickets, food, and money for the journey. 
and this deception seems to work on Germans and Jews. This is probably the most amazing part of the process, that it seems to all go on in a kind of matter-of-fact way. We don't see any massive riots at the uh, German collecting points. They do assemble, thinking that, you know, resettlement in the East might actually be better than walking around a German street by now and being abused. Their civil rights have been taken away, their dignity have been taken away, their property have been taken away. Many of them thought things might actually get better. They'd accept that they had no place in Germany, and maybe, hey, things in Poland could be no worse than what they are. The Jews will not discover the truth about their final destination until they are far from German soil. The Nazis continue their deception to the bitter end. The Commandant of Treblinka Death Camp orders the construction of a fake railway station, complete with painted wooden clock, its hands always fixed at six o'clock. Just enough to reassure the new arrivals. But this stop will be their last. Convinced they are to have a shower for health reasons, Men and women are separated and remove their clothes. Their hair and beards are shorn off. Then, suddenly, they are rushed into the tube, a narrow corridor lined with barbed wire. A dark chamber looms, but it is too late. The journey from train to death takes just 90 minutes. The Nazis are now operating such an efficient system, nothing can stop it. Not even when Reinhard Heydrich, the chief architect of the final solution, falls victim to an assassination attempt. At his funeral, the biggest sort of Nazi uh, showpiece funeral of the entire period, all the Nazis are there, and Hitler seems to even be shedding a few tears at losing this sort of right-hand Aryan Superman. In Heydrich's honor, his boss, SS chief Heinrich Himmler, names the death camp project Action Reinhardt and vows to step up the slaughter in Poland. In the forests of eastern Poland, the Nazis are carrying out their final solution to the Jewish question. It is genocide. At the end of 1942, Adolf Eichmann, the Nazis' killer bureaucrat, receives detailed reports from the secret Polish death camps over a million Jews have already been killed. Hitler's vision is being fulfilled. There was a time when the Jews in Germany laughed at my prophecies, but take my word for it, they will stop laughing everywhere. Following the Nazis' master plan, the Jews are being worked to death or murdered outright. Out in Poland, the Nazis are less discreet in their killing. The Majdanek concentration camp, built on a hill in full view of the city of Lublin, was originally intended to house Soviet prisoners of war. Under SS control, it becomes another grim destination for tens of thousands of Polish Jews, shipped in as forced laborers. Living in the most brutal conditions, many of them will die from sickness and exhaustion. As a key part of the Nazis' final solution, the camp is equipped with facilities for extermination. Poisonous carbon monoxide is used in the gas chambers, and a crematorium is installed with ovens to burn thousands of bodies. 
death camps, slave labor camps, extermination camps. It's hard to define which is which at some points. All we know is people are dying. They're dying through a number of ways. Starvation, some are being gassed, some are being systematically killed, some are being beaten to death. 200 miles to the west, one of the largest Polish work camps is transformed into the Nazis' most notorious killing machine. And it is here, at Auschwitz-Birkenau, that the mass murder of the final solution will reach a truly barbaric level. Alongside a vast industrial complex, Himmler orders the construction of gas chambers and crematoria capable of slaughtering up to 6,000 people every day. And the Nazis now have a new technique for murder, a chemical designed to kill pests. Zyklon B is a cyanide-based substance. In a warm, moist atmosphere, it turns from pellets into a highly toxic gas. The death cells were constructed with, with either pipes into them at high level or holes in the roof through which the pellets could be dropped. The killer pesticide is soon being used by the Nazis on a massive scale. They are moving here into absolutely new territory. Nobody in history has attempted to do something like this before. So they, 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 they are literally finding their way. Manufacturing Zyklon B boosts the profits of Germany's chemical industry. The complicity of the great manufacturing chemical companies is obvious. They later at Nuremberg and afterwards said, we didn't know what it's being used for. Why would you need Zyklon B on that scale of production if it wasn't against people? By this stage, many more Germans are becoming aware of what is happening to the Jews. There's one amazing incident where a, a freight train was going towards Auschwitz and one of the survivors said that he was in this freight train and he said that at one of the train stations, at a German station, somebody shouted, we know where you're going, to the gas chambers. So you can see that in these little towns even people knew what was happening. So I imagine in that particular freight train then, there was a certain amount of trepidation. To help finance his evil plans, Himmler turns the final solution into a commercial partnership between the SS and Germany's corporate giants. The SS make a fortune leasing out their Jewish prisoners, men, women and children, to work in IG Farben's factories. We can actually see that in the killing process, we do have partners in crime here, not just the Nazis, but also here a massive capitalist enterprise that enters into this project with the Nazis and actually finances it. And it's not just big business that's implicated in genocide. Thousands of ordinary Germans are making their own contribution. So you've got the train driver driving a trainload of Jews across Europe. He knows what's going on, but he's not asking any questions. You've got the civil servant working in some small department in Berlin who's probably responsible for supplying the cattle trucks for a certain shipment of Jews. He's just following orders. But what you've got are a lot of very small cogs, each of whom think, well, I'm not really taking part in this. I'm just doing a small thing. But when you put all those cogs together, then you've got a murder machine. But when you take it apart, each of those cogs can say, it wasn't me. With this complicity of silence, no German needs to speak openly about the final solution. No one needs to take responsibility. And all of this seems to happen with barely a flicker of protest back home. By 1943, Himmler is able to declare that Germany itself is almost Judenrein, Jew-free. The only resistance comes in one celebrated event. When the Nazis try to deport a group of Jews married to German women. 
famous occasion known as the Rosenstrasse affair, where a number of Jewish men had been rounded up, their non-Jewish wives came together and protested en masse uh, outside Nazi officials' houses and buildings. Such was their determination that threats to them to disperse went unheeded. When the protests become public, it causes real consternation at the highest levels. Even now, the Nazis are scared of admitting what is really going on. And the Nazi officials eventually came to the conclusion, far better to give way than to try and face them down. And the husbands were allowed to go back to the wives. They even reprieve 35 Jews who had already been sent to Auschwitz. But the Rosenstrasse protest is an isolated occasion. By now, the vast majority of Germans have other things to worry about. They are starting to lose the war, and their first concern is their own families. They were being, you know, bombed round the clock by the British and the Americans. They had huge food shortages. Um, their own children were dying in droves on the Eastern Front. Um, so, you know, I think there was very little capacity within many people's minds to actually really care about what was happening to some Jews. For Heinrich Himmler, the final solution represents a hideous triumph. A recording exists of his speech to a secret meeting of SS leaders. He is openly proud. This is a page of glory, never mentioned and never to be mentioned. This admission that we can't be acknowledged as heroes in the public eye is a sure sign that what they've done would be unacceptable. By now, they have killed some four million Jews since the start of the war. Another two million will be murdered before it is over. But the Germans must feel no guilt. Himmler shifts the blame onto the Jews they are responsible for their annihilation. We have the moral right. We had the duty to our people to do it, to kill this people who wanted to kill us. And so the German people become complicit in one of the worst crimes in history.